Boys and gents, one Lucid reaction, and this is the future of reasoning by the channel Vsauce. Vsauce uploaded a new video. It's a 30 minute long. Hmm, that's a new trend apparently. So yeah, it's about reasoning. Vsauce is gonna take more scientifical and philosophical take on reasoning, so it's gonna be fun. Yeah, I reacted to some Vsauce videos already. If you haven't seen them, check out the uh, link in the description. It's there somewhere. Check out the cast with the different playlists like Oscar in a nutshell, Real Life Floor, CGP Grey, all its sarcastic production, and yeah. Let's watch this one. Hey, Vsauce, Michael here. Where is your mind? Is it in your head? I mean, that's where your brain is, and your brain helps you remember and plan and make judgments and solve problems. But you also remember and plan with phones and notes and calendars and you make judgments and solve problems with all sorts of things. Ugh. You know, when you think about it, the brain is really just a wet lump of fat and protein no firmer than a blob of tofu. But the mind is huge. It's an ever-expanding organ of tissue and wood and stone and steel and people because of communication. Communication allows us to even make other people extensions of our minds. We can access their memories and perceptions and knowledge by simply asking, or not. <laughs> I don't need to learn how to fix a car and practice medicine and vulcanize rubber. Damn, that is true, isn't it? I never thought of that. Yeah, mine. I mean, basically, uh, if you have an assistant, uh, basically, you don't need to remember something. You can tell him to do, uh, remember certain things and just ask him later on when you need it. I mean, people do have aids and assistants like that. So that's, in a way, it's the same. You have tablets, phones that remembers for you. And even says, it's not like, oh, but at least you have to remember to check it. No, it even has the alarm system. When you want it, it will alarm and tell you something. Damn. Or, or remember everything, other people are doing that for me just as I do things for them. We are a species of individuals that is also one big interdependent lumbering growth, a frantic blur of flesh and concrete, yeah. a techno sapien. So just like I don't need to remember Vsauce's channel because YouTube's basically notification, even the recommendation page will tell me if the Vsauce uploads a new video, so I don't have to constantly check the channel. Powered by imaginations and passions made real by a hallowed faculty we call reason. Reason, it is said, guides us to truer knowledge and better decisions. It's allowed us to increase life expectancy, suffer less, work together better, and it's bound to take us further and higher until the end of time. Or is it? There you go. The organ we use to reason takes millions of years to evolve, but the fruits of reason grow rapidly and are ever accelerating. Over the next four decades, we are expected to build the equivalent of another New York City every month. And more concrete was installed in the last two decades outside the United States than the U.S. installed during the entire 20th century. This growth means that quality of life around the world is rising. It means that electricity, manufactured goods, food, comfort, and transportation are all becoming more common and accessible. But there are hints that reason and logic are struggling against the complexity of it all, against our growing dependence on the things we've built and their unintended consequences. Nearly every part of life as we know it today involves or relies on a process that releases molecules with lopsided electrical charges. This property causes them to absorb and re-emit thermal radiation, pinging it around so that it escapes into space more slowly. Having more warmer parcels of air means stronger weather events. They can't be pinned to any particular extreme storm, but they make extreme storms in general more extreme and frequent. Damn. What's at stake isn't just bad weather, it's disaster. It's more lives lost, more property lost, it's more droughts, more hunger, more famine, more people needing refuge, and an even greater reliance on the very things that caused the problem in the first place. In total, we release about 51 billion tons of such gases every year, 
and we need it to release zero. But how do you rethink That's... everything? I mean, yeah, that is so true, isn't it? We need that number to be zero if it's going to be effective. But how does that even... Man, it is... When you say it like that, it feels like, oh, is that ever going to happen? Because it doesn't feel like it. Who gets to direct the costs and trade-offs? How do you achieve collaboration between nearly every local and national government when what works in one place won't work everywhere, when decisions affect jobs in one place and food in another, when not just things need to be rethought, but also habits and traditions and values? How do you achieve consensus when a problem isn't obvious to the senses, is far away in space and time, requires solutions that affect people in different ways, and as a product of science always carries some uncertainty? The philosopher Timothy Morton calls something so massively distributed in time and space, and so viscous, so sticky that it adheres to all that touch it, a hyper-object. Every civilization that grows at the speed of reason must at some point face hyper-objects. In fact, the fact that we still haven't found evidence of intelligent life beyond Earth has been brought up as evidence that some sort of great filter might exist that yeah. few civilizations manage to get past. This could be one of that them. That a hyper object like our impact on the planet might be such a great filter yeah. is not a new idea. What? Yeah, I mean, I read to Kruzgazad video in that, obviously, you know, that's one of the case, like, maybe we screw up the planet so bad that is one of the filter that no civilization passed that. Like, there might have been some alien civilization who reached the point that we did but had the same issues. And before anybody could agree on anything, the planet was killed, they died out slowly, and that's the extinction event right there. So that's one of the great filter. What it might take to solve it is the topic of Bill Gates's How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. And I decided to do this video in partnership with him and his team because the way we deal with hyper objects reveals a lot about the mind it's easy and common to think that we would all be better off if everyone was just more rational, right? <laughs> but what if reasoning wasn't built for what we've become? Let's begin by looking at behavioral the inertia. Behavioral inertia is the tendency to keep doing what you're already doing, status quo bias. It can be a frustrating bias if you desire change, but its origin isn't a flaw. If an organism has managed to survive long enough to reproduce and provide and care for its offspring, then the state of its world was sufficient for its genes to spread. That's all it takes to persist. The types of organisms we see around us will naturally be those that managed to persist and didn't, after reaching that point, rock the boat too much. So behavioral inertia can help slow down the accumulation of unintended consequences and the loss of ideas that work, but it can also slow down innovation and adaptation. Yeah. If the environmental impacts of our society were more immediate and unignorable, it wouldn't be so tempting to apply this inertial break. But emissions are invisible, and their consequences aren't immediate or local. They impact future people and people far away, those who are different from us, poorer than us, people we will never meet. This may be one of the first challenges advancing civilizations face, wielding not just the power of technology and distributed cognition, but also the responsibilities. Extending the mind is really cool, but whether or not a species can extend their empathy might be a great filter, surely. Reasoning will allow us to do that, right? I mean, yeah, in a way, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. I mean, it has that mentality that if it worked in the past, of course, it's going to work for the future. And it has less chance of causing some unintended consequence. That makes sense. That's how basically lots of species survives because whatever they did was effective. But, uh, you know, that also stops the different innovation, different way of looking at things. 
and when it comes to you know all the things that global warming and things are causing yes it will basically affect poorer people in the future so you know basically this is why there are some rich people who basically pay off senators and congressmen uh, to you know deny global warming and things like that it's always you know any senator and congressman says like global warming is not real and comes with a snowball in the congress if you find that out oh, they are getting paid off by lots of rich people cock brothers and things like that so you know oil barons and yeah so they know they are going to be fine in the future even if everything goes wrong because they know global warming is real they're just denying it for the profit so uh, you know every movie about the future there's always rich people who you know just living great and always poor people who are basically just you know surviving day by day and there is a massive gap between them this is just ridiculous man well what is reasoning well reasoning is a way of making inferences an inference is a piece of new information extracted from the information you already have. Now, we make inferences all the time. Every living thing does. For example, we don't have measuring tape tentacles that shoot from our eyes. And what actually enters our brain is just a 2D image. But nonetheless, our brains can infer depth by attending to cues like stereopsis, occultation, perspective, parallax, size. Now, when this happens, we accept it as reality. We aren't aware of the visual processing that made it possible, and we don't have to be. If, however, we do consciously consider why a certain conclusion was reached, well, then, boom, that's reasoning. Reasoning is the process of making inferences not automatically and instinctively, but by looking at facts and seeing what conclusions they support. When Eratosthenes calculated the circumference of the Earth to within a percentage or two of the value accepted today, he didn't do it by measuring the Earth and he didn't just perceive it as self-evident. No, he inferred it from what he knew about shadows and how long it took camels to move. Stories like that make it easy to believe that reasoning evolved because it supercharged our cognitive abilities. I mean, it clearly moves us towards truer conclusions, better decisions, and knowledge no other species could infer. Attempts to describe the rules of good, orderly reason became logic and mathematics, concepts so general and abstract that while we were still animals, <laughs> armed with them, we were no longer beasts. But that's the rub, isn't it? If reasoning is so great, why are we the only species with such a sophisticated grasp of it? And if its purpose is truth and good judgment, why don't we all agree on everything? Yeah, reasoning is one of the things that are getting threatened right now, isn't it? The way he described reasoning basically means like, you know, using the facts and the tools you have if you reach a certain level of you know agreement on something then you agree on that and move forward you can never know anything for 100 percent fact and all the people who deny science basically uses that like they pick and choose certain thing here and there and try to deny it and claim that you don't know something about 100 percent you don't know 100 percent sure the earth is round I mean, uh, you know, there are basically, we have literal footage from the space, but those are fake. So, okay, fine, let's do something f f on Earth. Let's use the, you know, three wells, uh, basically, experiment and do that. Hmm, uh, how sure are you from that? So, you know, they don't see the reason in things like that. So, reasoning is one of the things that are getting threatened right now. I mean, you can only know certain things at a certain extent. You can't know anything for 100% sure. I think, therefore, I am. That's all you know. After that, everything is open to interpretation. So, you know, this is how the world moved from the long, long time. And now everybody's basically pick and choose to fit their narrative of the thing rather than seeing reason. It's tempting to think that disagreements happen because, well, I am being rational, but those who disagree with me are being irrational. Ugh! If only people would just use logic and reason. Yes. What's happened to the world? <laughs> well, that's a fair complaint if you're arguing over logic puzzles, but the world is not a logic puzzle. This, however, is one. 
Paul is looking at Mary. Mary is looking at Peter. Paul is married. Peter is unmarried. Is a married person looking at an unmarried person? Yes, no, or not enough information to decide. Now think about it. The answer is yes. You may have thought there's no way to know because we don't know if Mary is married. But look, she either is or she isn't. And if she is, well then she... Yeah, is married person looking at an unmarried person? Yeah, that is true, isn't it? So Paul is looking at Mary. Now Mary could be married, but could not be. So yeah, then Mary is looking at Peter. Now Peter is unmarried. Again, Mary could be married or not married. So it's married person looking at an unmarried person. Yeah. A married person is looking at Peter, an unmarried person. If she isn't, then Paul, a married person, is looking at her, an unmarried person. So no matter what Mary's deal is, the answer will be yes. When people get this puzzle wrong and the correct answer is explained to them, they almost always immediately see why it's right and change their mind. Yeah. Life is not always like that. Let's take a look at a logical syllogism. All elephants are awesome. Michael is an elephant. Therefore, Michael is awesome. The conclusion is logically valid. It follows from the assumptions. But are the assumptions true? No, I am not an elephant. Also, this premise is subjective. I mean, what does it mean to be Seriously? awesome? Can we measure it with an awesomeometer? So you can see why when analyzing something like our impact on the planet, logic can only be a partial tool. If some people have more to lose than others, who gets to decide which assumptions are fair? Still though, it would seem that reasoning should be able to help here. If each of us would just attend only to the facts, surely we'd all recognize the same reasonable approach. Problem is, that's not how reasoning works. Since the scientific study of human reasoning began about a hundred years ago, it has been found again and again that not only are we bad at reasoning, lazy and biased, but we actually seem almost programmed to be bad, like the flaws are intentional. In an episode of Mind Field, I once used a magician to pull off a little experiment. He asked people to look at two faces and choose which of the two they would prefer to work with, placing their preferences in one pile and those they rejected into another. Then the pile of people they picked were shown again, and each person was asked to provide a reason for why they chose that person. But with a little sleight of hand, the magician managed to sneak in some of the faces they had just rejected. Amazingly, the majority of people didn't even notice the trick. Not only that, they were able to effortlessly explain the reasons behind their choice. A choice they never actually made. Remembering faces you've only seen briefly isn't the easiest thing to do, but other studies have shown that even if the task involves answering questions about one's political beliefs, things we... Yeah, I think, you know, this goes into uh, one scary area where people say that you'd have no free will. I mean, you're, you basically, it's, you know, everything is predetermined. You think you have a free will, but you don't. I mean, there was a video from CGP Grey about you are too in which this was if you cut your brain in two, uh, there are two sp like split personalities. Now one side does something, other side basically doesn't do that, obviously, but it's now coming up with all the reasoning of why it did that, because surely, you know, yeah. So our mind basically, we just randomly choose something. But we don't, we don't remember what we chose in this trick, basically. And he even slips in some of them we didn't choose. But our mind, you know, we basically don't remember that. But we also try to come up with reason. Surely uh, there was some reason I chose that. And we just try to think of the reasons. Damn. <laughs> we would seemingly have a firmer grasp on. Nearly half of participants will fail to notice that the answers they gave have been reversed 
when they're later asked to explain them. Point is, we seem practically built to give reasons for whatever we think we must, and not the reasons we actually used to reach a conclusion. That's scary, What if man. we don't even use reasons to reach conclusions? Well, let's talk about intuitions. Our brains no, have a- No, that, that point scares me with that thing. Like, we don't have free will. Everything's predetermined. You know, your, your mind is basically, things you, you're going to do, you're going to do is just predetermined. And then you rationalize it with some kind of a reason. You come up with a reason, like why you did that. Even though, you know, the reason wasn't there when you made that decision. Oh, damn. Evolved over millions of years to react to the world around us in brilliant ways with little to no input from us. Uh, for example, when you notice that someone is upset, you don't consciously think, hmm, okay, so, uh, well, their eyebrows are kind of in that position and their speech seems curt. Their posture is... <gasps> These are all reasons to conclude that they are upset. No, instead, the belief that they may be upset was just apparent. You intuited it. You know it without exactly knowing how you came to know it. The mood-recognizing parts of your brain operate in a way that is opaque to your awareness. But if someone asks you, uh, why do you think they're upset? You can nonetheless produce all sorts of reasons. Yeah. Some may have actually been the ones your brain attended to, but they're all just guesses. Instead of using reasoning to come to conclusions, we use conclusions to come to reasons. God damn, that is so true. I mean, you know, lots of things people do in their life. Uh, there is a technique of th things that they do in their life. But whenever you stop and try to think of, okay, let's talk in detail. Why do I do it like that? Then you're like, okay, I do that. It's not just like I randomly do that. Obviously, I, I do that for a reason. Then you try to think why I do that. And you can't come up with answer, but you're, you're basically having a hard time to think of things. Then you just come up with like, oh, I knew all of that, but it's just, it was in my subconscious or something, you know, I, I couldn't come up at the time, but I obviously knew that that's how I did it. But no, the basically, you know, you come up with reasoning later on. That is so, it's effed up bad. Now, to be fair, we can go the other way. We love puzzles, and when we don't have a strong intuition either way, we can sit down and mull over various reasons to think one thing or another. Our love of puzzles suggests that reasoning has a survival value. Organisms that found it pleasurable would be more likely to use it. But when we reason alone, even when we have no motivation to reach any particular conclusion, we still exhibit deep biases that seem less like mistakes and more like features. For example, it's been shown that between two otherwise similar products, people will prefer to buy the one with more functions. Even if they don't want those functions, never plan to use them and think they're all pointless and overly complicated. Why? Well, it might be that we find such decisions easier to justify to others we won't wind up being potentially embarrassed when someone asks why we didn't get the product with more functions. Well, after decades of findings like this, Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber began to hypothesize that reasoning didn't evolve to help us make better decisions, but instead to help us be social. Humans inhabit a cognitive niche on this planet. We aren't strong or sharp or hidden or venomous. Instead, our advantage comes from cognition, reasoning, and cooperation. We can plan hunts, build traps, and engage in coordinated strategies that can be tested and modified on the fly, not by millennia of evolution. Reason allows us to do those things. It's hard to convince people that your intuitions are true, but if you can give reasons for them, it's a whole heck of a lot easier to convince people that you're right. Being able to argue over what the best thing to do is is vital when it comes to coordinating action. Reasons also allow us to justify ourselves in the eyes of others, to explain who we are and express the kinds of reasons we like, what others can expect from us, and what we will likely expect from them. This social theory of reasoning helps explain why two people can earnestly and rationally arrive at two different views. They each have their own unique brain and values and dispositions and experiences, and those are what drove their thinking. 
the reasons they give may or may not be the real reasons they came to their conclusions, but it's the best anyone can do. The social theory also explains why people tend to give such weak So let me give this a reason, it's just our, uh, our way of convincing others in a way to, you know, basically, you know, basically, first of all, it's a social need. And obviously, in our, you know, basically, it's one of the one of the things that we, you know, have from since the, you know, basically caveman times. Where being social was important, otherwise you wouldn't survive. So you give reasoning to others to convince uh, them to what you what your point is, basically, regardless of if, if it's that's the reason why you came at that point in the first place. Huh? It's a convincing thing, convincing strategy type of thing. Reasons for their beliefs at first, or when their intended audience doesn't need much convincing. It would be a waste of time and cognitive resources to construct Grand Slam reasons for everything I said and did and thought when it wasn't necessary. Instead, I can offload some of that work to other people. Uh, for example, if I say, I want to have lunch at ABC Burgers, well, my friend might respond, ah, no thanks, I had burgers yesterday. And I might reply back, oh, well, that's no problem. They also have hot dogs and great salads. But if my friend said, ah, no thanks, I'm trying to spend less money eating out this month, I could reply, oh, well, ABC Burgers is really cheap and I've got a coupon. Now, what's going on here is that I'm providing reasons only as my friend presses for them. If they press harder and harder, my reasons will become better and better until either I win them over or we come to some different, more harmonious decision. So when people appear to be lazy reasoners or to have bad reasons or none at all, it's usually just the case that they're using reason as it evolved to function. This is very uh, simple example, but yeah, in this case like this, obviously you would give out the reason they would fit uh, the problem that you have in front of you, like what your friend is saying. Hmm, what is the reason I can use that will convince him? Obviously, you're gonna say that. You knew all of those things, but you only need the reason that fits the thing here. So that's not really, you know, uh, hard to think. But uh, the one thing I'm thinking of, like your base, you know, your views, political views on lots of things, your uh, complex uh, views on things. Why did you come on those views? Now, the reason could be very different. It might not be socially accepted reason. So you would come up with a reason that would be more socially accepted. So you would say something that would convince people why your views are about right. But that's not probably the reason why you came at that view. If you say something about why you came at that view, that might not be socially accepted. You also think of that. Yeah, that, I never thought of that. Socially, it starts off weak improving if others push it and always tailoring its work to the intended audience. The social theory of reasoning can even explain the existence of biases that otherwise make little sense. For example, it would seem that in coming to conclusions about the world, it would behoove an organism to pay particular attention to information that went against what it believed. I mean, that way, they would be able to adjust their beliefs, making them truer, more general and more complete. To a certain extent, that is what happens, but not always. When someone does their own research, they often come to the very conclusion they wanted in the first place. This is called confirmation bias. Our tendency to look for, prefer, and interpret information so that it confirms what we already think. It frustrates our ability to accept new inconvenient data and is a problem for the intellectualist view of reason. If reason is for finding truth and making better decisions, why would it have this major weakness? Well, because, the social theory says, reasoning is a group activity. Let's say that I think option A is true and the best, and you think option B is true and the best. Well, if we both researched both options and sifted through reasons in support of both options, we would both have twice the work to do than we would if instead I simply came up with reasons for why I was right and you attended to reasons for why you were right. 
The confirmation bias at least halves the cognitive work that must be done. Now, sometimes... <laughs> Damn, okay. So basically, if I have a bias of a point, I would, you know, research hard on only that point because I'm like, oh, fuck that. I'm not, I'm not researching that point. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right. Let's research on that and prove that I'm right. Other guys going to do the same thing. We both will provide the findings of whatever right is right. But now we only did the half of the works. Otherwise, we would have done because I would have researched my thing and his thing just to see who's right. That would have doubled the work. <laughs> Lone reasoner will have a bad idea or a decent idea with some bad parts. The reasons they have to justify for and argue for it will be sufficient for them and those who intuitively agree, but they may be weak. However, subjected to deliberation, put forth into the machine of collective thought, it can be evaluated and judged not by one mind or a group of minds thinking alike, but by something very special, the crowd. Humans have long known of the wisdom of the crowds, the phenomenon by which a collection of many people can process information into a conclusion better than any one person could do alone. It's why we don't trust big decisions to a single person, no matter how educated or powerful they are. Instead, we ask a group of people to deliberate, to reason together. In this way, the biases and errors of each is smoothed out. And Crowd is a strong word. Group of experts in certain field. If you just take a topic to the general public, like it happened during the Brexit, people will come to conclusion, but they won't. You know, they won't have first knowledge of what they are talking about because they are not even come close to being an expert in the field. So, you know, basically, you know, consensus, basically, you know, uh, if you if you put out a, a paper, you know, about certain thing, like, you know, this is my paper, this is my theory on things, there will be other people who test it out, you know, over and over again, 10, 15, 20 scientists, and everybody will come, you know, put their results on. If 18 uh, out of 20, 18 results is the same as the original one, there you go. You have the group consensus like, yeah, that is true. It, it, it repeated 18 times. Decision wiser. In a famous example, it's been repeatedly shown that if you ask a bunch of people to guess how many jelly beans are in a jar, you'll find that the average of all their answers is closer to the real number than any one individual was alone. What happens is that although some people may guess a number that is, like, way too big, that mistake is balanced out by the fact that others will inevitably guess a number that is way too small. Altogether, their disagreement evens out into spectacular accuracy. Damn. We have now arrived at the problem. Reasoning evolved to be used socially where many different perspectives had to all deliberate towards a common conclusion. Such contexts are becoming less and less common, and it is becoming easier and easier to simply be a lone reasoner, justifying only a particular viewpoint without doing the harder work of deliberating and acting. The internet gives voices to more perspectives than ever before in our history, but it also makes it easy to disengage from accountability and to find places where everyone believes what you do. Furthermore, because of technology... Yeah, I mean, pre-internet, you know, pre if, you, uh, if you want to tackle a topic, you needed to go to a medium. Like, if you want to talk about scientific topic, I mean, you go to where the debate is happening, where there are experts and the people who are not expert and, you know, group together, reasoning comes out. Now with the internet, there are forums and things where people create this kind of, a, I guess, subreddits and things where people just group together who thinks one way and just stick with it. We are the flat earthers. There you go. I mean, yeah, that is a massive problem, man. I mean, before people were just, you know, like flat earth, they were spread around everywhere. There were very few of them. Now, where the discussion was happening, wherever it might be, you know, people gather there, there are lots of experts, and, you know, the flat earthers with then, you know, not much of basis with their theory were very small numbers. So reasoning persisted, like, you know, they, they were basically filtered out. Now all the flat earthers of the world could gather around in just one place. And just say, like, screw that, you know, we are flat earthers, that's it. 
we confront more issues more rapidly than ever before that we are expected to have opinions about. And the growing complexity and specialization of the modern world makes it difficult for each of us to have well-informed, prepared reasons for the accelerating accretion of intuitions we must form. In response, we look for people who can defend our intuitions for us. The reasons they give don't have to be good, just good enough that we can feel like justification exists. Damn. In the past, unconvincing reasons had to be painted on sandwich boards, but now the democratization of communication means that even unpopular, unconvincing, nonsensical ideas can be presented with the same trust-inducing typefaces and professional look as common ones. People can challenge the weak reasons of others, show them to be contradictory and produce better reasons for their side, but to what end? It's all preparation for a debate that never comes. We each play a very small role in deciding how society is run. Even if a good faith discussion between a representative slice of America came to a resolution, if nothing can come of it, why not just throw shade and sick burns or revel in the pleasure of reasoning by treating everything like a big giant puzzle? It's easy to think that it doesn't matter because after all, those in charge, the brilliant scientists and powerful billionaires will surely come to the rescue. Some giant techno-salvation is surely on the horizon. Perhaps it is, but everything we know about reason suggests that those implementing it should be held accountable by as many different perspectives as possible. Leaders could lead deliberations and be elected for their ability to moderate social reasoning. Yeah, mic drop moments, basically. This is the biggest issue in Twitter and social media culture right now. Even people who are, you know, basically backed by scientific facts, even they debate to a certain extent, you know, mic drop and basically leaves. And what did that actually do? I mean, act, you know, debating where it actually matters, nobody's actually doing that. You know, but people who have power, like in Congress, senators basically getting paid off by billionaires. I mean, nobody's holding them accountable. Uh, you know, people are constantly arguing in social medias, but is that even matter? I mean, people think hashtags will solve things, but does it? But that's boring. Why lead when you could follow? Look at what some people believe and generate reasons for why they're right, and they'll love it. Of course, the hard work, the real work, the work that truly elevates us on this planet is not in telling people that they're right, but in trying to convince others. And in doing so, use reason as it evolved to be used. The future of reason may in fact be the past of reason. In practice, what does all this look like? Well, some researchers have gone so far as to recommend national deliberation days where citizens celebrate by literally joining small groups and talking through their opinions and comparing reasons. Tests of such strategies have shown that a return to the small, targeted discussions our reasoning abilities evolved to excel in leaves all participants with a greater understanding of not just what they believe and why, but about decisions that could actually be made and actions that could be taken. Others have gone even further, recommending that the future of reason at its best is the construction of a lotocracy, a form of government where decisions are made not by elected leaders, but by people literally chosen at random. We decide the fate of a person this way. Why not the fate of the people? What if decisions were made not by politicians alone, but at least occasionally by groups of actual citizens representing differences in- Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. You know, you need certain level of, level of expertise, even being a politician. Lots of people, I mean, that's how Donald Trump came into power. Everybody's like, screw it, we need an outsider. But yeah, but you need somebody who knows how to run things. If you choose people at random, if they don't know what the fuck they are doing, that's a really bad area, man. That could screw up things really badly. I mean, I, nah, I'm not so sure about this. Thought, not just geography, who were brought together and paid for their time to learn from experts and then deliberate on an assigned issue until a conclusion was reached or, at the least, 
a recommendation. Instead of being motivated by re-election, money, attention, and power, individuals chosen at random would have only their conscience to guide them. Special interests and corporations wouldn't be able to cozy up to those likely to be elected, because if any one of us could someday serve, they'd have to cozy up to and protect all of us. Instead of the learning... I don't think that's the answer. The answer to this is fixing political... Uh, way we basically do things. Fixing the voting system, alternate voting and things like that. You know, fixing how much politician can accept money from somebody. There are other ways than just choosing people at random because I feel like this is disaster waiting to happen if you just choose people at random. Just like you, you choose them in the jury. And just, you know, basically... Uh, you know, just let them, you know, when it comes to jury, it's basic like, you know, you're using your common sense to decide if someone's guilty or not. Just just the way uh, debate happens there between the lawyers or whatever. You just decide that whatever you heard, what your mind thinks of if the person's guilty or not. Running the world is a different thing. Running the places and what is the best decision. I don't think random people is a good answer there and deliberation being done by people you will never meet, with offices and buildings you can't access, gradually, over time, more and more of your very own neighbors would have had the honor. People chosen at random would obviously lack the same celebrity status and mandate that elected leaders cultivate and achieve. And uh, iconic figures we relate to aren't bad, but our understanding of reasoning is making it more and more clear that we evolved not to leave the thinking up to a few great minds, but to the authority of the great mind, the lumbering organ of thought that is everyone and everything. This is, in fact, how democracy first worked. Lotteries were used to fill many political positions in ancient Athens. Aristotle explained that the appointment of magistrates by lot is thought to be democratic, and the election of them is oligarchic. An oligarchy is government by only a small number of people. Look, regardless of how reason is brought back to its social root... Dude, what's happening in China is oligarchy, you know, president for life and government for life, whatever, understand that. But government has, uh, you know, in democratic worlds, basically government and politicians can change if you vote it like that. Obviously, gerrymandering and shit like that threatens the things. But like I said, alternate voting, uh, restricting people how much money they can accept from things, you know, for the, you know, basically election things. People spend billion or billion dollars doing the elections. How does that even work, man? I mean, you shouldn't be able to, you know, spend that much money. So there are other answers than just random people, but I don't think that's going to work. Random people cannot run the world. You need certain little expertise. And as far as the reasoning that evolved during the collection of people, that collection doesn't have to be everybody, but just large enough that it works. You know, and Senate and Congress is already large enough. The way it's failing, it's fixable eventually, but I don't think the answer is uh, random people. Roots. If we can build more and better arenas for deliberation and use them to apply reason properly to hyper objects like the impact of our emissions on the planet, we'll have taught one heck of a lesson to people a hundred, a thousand years in the future. I like to think that although widening participation will be difficult, it might provide us with a kind of existential security. The impact of emissions on our planet is not going to be the last hyper object we face. If we can do a good job with it, maybe far in the future, when our civilization has advanced to the point at which, I don't know, people can be quantumly recreated or something, they'll look back at our time and say, hey, let's bring them all back to life. We could use the cooperative abilities they had then. Ultimately, the old saying that history is the great teacher isn't a bad guide. We will all someday be teachers ourselves because someday we will all be history. We will someday be the ancients, and we can choose what that will mean. And as always, thanks for watching. Yeah, as far as the global warming things, look, I like Neil deGrasse Tyson, all right? Lots of people think he has an ego, he's pretentious and things like that. 
I see past all of that. I like his core thoughts that he gives out. And I feel like, uh, you know, the people that are basically denying global warming, people are getting misled, misled like sheep. Only reason that's happening and only reason they are not uh, seeing the truth into the scientists rather than just people debating. There are a lot, literally there are senators and congressmen that are saying that you go with your facts, I will go with how people feel. That, that alone is a massive red flag. The people feel and think differently and, uh, you know, they basically cannot see the reason and even the fact that comes forward from scientists and they don't trust the scientists only because whatever scientists put out, they can't even read it. I mean, uh, science illiteracy is the issue here. Failure of education system is the issue here. There are lots of issues spread around, but this is one of the core issues. If people were more scientifically literate and they could see what the scientists are talking about and they could actually understand, they won't just point blank reject them. Like, oh, that, that's just, they are wrong, they're biased. I trust Fox News, I trust that senator. That's, that senator came with a snowball in the Congress. This must be the, you know, there are still snow around. So how could the world be warming up? Only reason you can say that is because you don't even understand anything about science. So, you know, just, there are massive issues that needed to fix when it comes to Congress, Senate, uh, you know, uh, changing the system and just putting random people there is not the answer. I think there are more, you know, uh, uh, detailed way we could fix it. Like I said, you know, alternate voting. So, you know, basically uh, the people's representatives actually get represented there, uh, you know, uh, restricting people how much money they can accept from people so they can't be bought out and there are lots of things that we could do uh, obviously it's hard to do all of these things but still there are things that we could do rather than just putting people in random so yeah this was a great video all right people if you like my ricks and like and subscribe check out the ricks and there's a link in the description check out the cast all the playlist check out the end cards and i'll see you next time